let me uh, uh, start with uh, a few things about uh, myself and my group. Uh, I'm from uh, uh, Istanbul Technical University Energy Institute, actually. Uh, I worked there uh, for a very long time, and then three years ago, I moved from Istanbul, Turkey, to Sweden, Uppsala. And now I am visiting professor in uh, materials uh, theory division in Uppsala University, uh, where I met uh, David uh, three years ago, almost three years ago. Uh, I have a research group uh, called Nano Energy Research Group, and mainly we focus on quantum size and shape effects uh, of uh, on thermodynamic and transport behaviors of finite systems. And we are also trying to propose some nano-energy conversion mechanisms and uh, devices. Uh, so we, we are a small group, uh, and Alhun, which you already met uh, a few minutes ago, uh, he is one of the most uh, productive uh, group members uh, of me. Uh, so... Uh, let me say a few more things uh, about thermodynamics in general. Uh, do you hear me? I, I, because I have no any response. Uh, so if yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I hear okay. you. Okay, good. So, uh, so if, uh, as you already know, uh, thermodynamics started as a phenomenological science, mainly during the Industrial Revolution. Uh, so, uh, like uh, Boyle law, uh, Guy-Lussac law, or Charles uh, law, or uh, even the Carnot efficiency, they are all based on observations, measurements, experiments. Uh, so, they measure something and then uh, they uh, establish some relations in between, but they, have, uh, they had no idea uh, what is the mechanism behind these relations and uh, behind this physics. So it didn't continue in that way, and in the uh, mid of 19th centuries, uh, the Clausius, Emmanuel Clausius, uh, he is one of he was one of the uh, scientists who attempt uh, to explain uh, the mechanical uh, origins of heat and entropy, mechanical. Uh, reasons. Uh, so he tried to explain heat and entropy uh, based on um, mechanical theories. So after, uh, after that, uh, of course, uh, it was the Boltzmann uh, who put case tone uh, on that field. And because of him, we have, uh, after this relation, we have kinetic theory of causes, statistical mechanics, statistical thermodynamics, uh today everything uh, what we have in in, in these uh, fields uh, we owe to uh, Boltzmann and other colleagues like uh, Maxwell Gibbs and many other uh, people who contributed to uh, to the development of statistical mechanics actually and because of their contribution today we are able to connect microscopic and macroscopic uh uh, properties of systems. Uh, do you see also my mouse, or uh, I should choose uh, a laser pointer? Do you see? Um, yeah, we, we see you with your mouse, but good, um, good, good. Then, if you see it, then it's okay. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, by using the methods of statistical mechanics, uh, we can relate these microscopic and macroscopic uh, properties of a system. So, if you uh, look at the uh, thermodynamics, uh, we can classify it uh, by considering uh, the, physical, uh, assist, uh, the physical size of the system, temperature or density. If you consider the physical sizes of the system uh, and consider the mega scale systems uh, like the whole universe or galaxy or nebula or black hole or star or even the globe, uh, the Earth, uh, the planets, then you have to consider relativistic effects or curvature of space of time, uh, space time, or at least gravitational effects uh, into account. So you have to consider these type of effects and use relativistic thermodynamics. 
uh, at, in mid scale, uh, classical thermodynamics works pretty well, and uh, we design our power plants and engines and refrigerators, everything around you uh, today, uh, what we have in technology is mostly based on uh, classical thermodynamics. Uh, if you scale down further and come to the micro or nano scale, then we need nano or quantum thermodynamics to, uh, to analyze uh, these kind of very small systems. Then classical and quantum size effects has to be considered. Uh, if you consider temperature scale, then you may classify thermodynamics uh, again uh, as relativistic thermodynamics for extremely high temperatures and intermediate temperatures. Again, classical thermodynamics works very well. And uh, if you go uh, to very low temperatures, then you have to consider quantum thermodynamics where quantum degeneracy effects plays important role. Then uh, you can consider superconductivity, superfluidity, or Bose-Einstein condensation phenomena, etc. Uh, if you look at the density scale, again, for extremely high densities, you have to consider both relativistic and quantum thermodynamics. Uh, at intermediate densities, again, classical thermodynamics, but at very low densities, you have to consider gas kinetic effects. Uh, so, uh, we will focus on uh, uh, thermodynamics of small scale systems. So, if you I'll do. sorry, yeah. Can you, can you go back? I don't know if it was only me, but maybe uh, your internet just shut down a little bit. So, can you, yeah, can you explain about the high densities, intermediate densities, and very low densities again, please? Yes, sure. Uh, at extremely high densities, like the uh, early stage of universe or neutron stars or uh, a nucleus of an atom, and then you have to consider both relativistic and quantum thermodynamics if you choose uh, the uh, choose any of them as as your system. Uh, so uh, at intermediate densities, uh, classical thermodynamics works well. But at very low densities, you have to consider kinetic, gas kinetic effects into account. So, uh, but today we will uh, focus on uh, uh, thermodynamics of small scale systems. So, uh, in micro scale, uh, classical size effects are dominant. Uh, but uh, at nano scale, uh, quantum size effects become dominant. Uh, we will focus on nano thermodynamics. Uh, before we go further, let me say a few words about uh, the story of uh, man-made small structures. Uh, maybe most of you, maybe all of you already know uh, this story, but uh, the story of man-made man small structures start uh, with uh, uh, Richard Feynman's famous competition in 1959. Uh, it was a competition for production of an electrical motor smaller than one over 64 inch around one point, uh, sorry, 0.4 millimeter. Uh, and he announced that uh, the price uh, will be $1,000 and I check it, it corresponds to today's $9,000. It's quite good amount of money for a student. And here on the left, uh, we see the winner, uh, William McLennan. Uh, and uh, Feynman is checking, uh, work, uh, checking the electrical motor uh, when it is working under the microscope. And this is the, the, uh, the pin hat, and this is the electrical motor uh, produced by uh, William McLennan. So after that, uh, after 40 years later, uh, let me say, uh, his famous, uh, Feynman's famous speech uh, was inscribed on a gold plate with a no, uh, nanometric letters. And for two days, we are at, at, at this uh, level. Uh, we are able to put 135 million uh, transistors in a square of millimeter. Uh, so this is an amazing achievement within a 60 years. So not only electronic device, of course, we have today 
lots of mechanical, no, micro and nano mechanical devices as well. So if you look at here, uh, we see a waveguide, a nanometric waveguide, but we see here there are lots of uh, channels having a five nanometer uh, thickness. And uh, you see the, uh, the very sharp uh, angles here, right angles. So we are able to manufacture all these structures. So after these achievements, uh, thermodynamics uh, asked uh, many questions, actually. So if you are interested in uh, to do thermodynamics uh, of small systems, then we have to ask these kind of questions. What changes in small scale thermodynamics? Or what kind of effects dominate the thermodynamic behaviors of small systems? Are thermodynamics of micro and nano systems are different from each other? How and why? Or uh, can we successfully predict these behaviors by using by developing some theoretical models? And maybe last uh, question, uh, can we use these possible effects to design superior thermodynamic cycles, engines, devices, and even materials? So in order to answer these questions, let's uh, start to look at the first microsystems and then uh, go to nanoscale systems and start uh, to talk about uh, the problem that I want to uh, talk today. But first, let's ask what changes in microscale. Uh, most of you already know these things, but these are for undergraduate students. Maybe they, are, uh, they also know. But if you go to microscale, uh, if you uh, scale down the sizes of the uh, structures, then you increase the uh, surface uh, over volume ratio. And then uh, the surface effects becomes uh, dominant. So at macro scale, we nearly uh, or almost completely neglect uh, the, the surface effects. But at micro scale, we have to consider surface effects as well. So this is why some bags uh, can stand on uh, water and uh, top bubbles uh, try to minimize their uh, surface area. And you, you see these capillarity effects. These are all because of uh, surface and edge effects, which become dominant uh, at uh, micro scale. If you consider a very small water droplets uh, and uh, uh, compare the inner and ex internal and external pressure, and this uh, pressure difference increase enormously when we decrease the radius of the droplet. If you check it, for 10 nanometer droplet, for example, the pressure difference can be as high as 150 bar. It's a huge pressure difference. So what we see here, uh, without considering the surface effects or edge effects, it is not possible to do thermodynamics uh, in micro scale uh, systems. So what else? Uh, well, uh, in micro scale, uh, uh, we also lose continuum uh, approach it breaks down uh, most of all, you already know Knudsen number it is the mean free path over characteristic length of our structure and for air at standard temperature and pressure it's around 70 nanometers so if your structure is much bigger than 70 nanometers for example if you are dealing with air uh, then you can safely use uh, continuum uh, approach and so the 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 navier stokes equations or Euler equations and so on but if you scale down uh, and uh, come to the same order of magnitude uh, of uh, mean free path then you lose some uh, conditions which you use uh, in continuum approach uh, this is uh, actually the you have to change your boundary conditions from non-slip non, non boundary condition to slip boundary condition. If you go down, down, and then you get free molecular flow, re flow regime where the, the, the size of the structures uh, are bigger than mean free path. In that case, I don't want to uh, talk about the details, but what I want to say at that level, even pressure and viscosity lose their meanings. 
in free molecular flow regime. You can talk about uh, momentum flux, a tensor, uh, diagonal and off diagonal elements of it, but you can't uh, define pressure and viscosity anymore. So uh, many things uh, change. So what changed in nanoscale? Uh, well, then uh, in nanoscale, wave character of particles become important and causes quantum size and shape effects. So uh, all of you already know that uh, a particle uh, moving with momentum P, uh, P uh, corresponds to a wave propagating with uh, wave number K, K. So, and there is a simple relation in between them. And because of wave character of particles, some quantities are modified. And uh, one of the most important one is the probability density, of course. Uh, in classical thermodynamics, we use just one over V as a uh, probability density, and it is homogeneous because in thermodynamics, we, we, we use equilibrium assumption. So in equilibrium state, uh, probability density in classical picture is homogeneous. But when you consider the wave character of particles, then the probability density is the ensemble average of quantum probability density, which is not homogeneous. So now uh, it has changed, modified. The other one is, of course, it, this is trivial, but momentum spectrum. In classical picture, it is continuous. In quantum picture, it is discrete. And what else? It, uh, it is the lowest, uh, the, the, the third one, uh, which is modified because of wave character of particles, is the lowest values of momentum components. In classical picture, uh, a particle can be at rest. I mean, uh, uh, the velocity or the momentum can take zero value. But uh, in quantum picture, this is not allowed. In a finite system, finite size system, particles uh, are actually restless. So they are uh, continuously has to move. Uh, even at ground state, they have this amount of momentum uh, component in each direction. Uh, L is here the, the size of the domain in uh, each direction. So uh, actually this uh, difference causes quantum size effects on thermodynamic state functions. We will see it. This uh, looks like a small difference, but it causes a very uh, uh, appreciable and consider considerable differences uh, in thermodynamics. And of course, these ones also cause some uh, considerable differences. So let's consider quantum size effects on thermodynamic properties. Uh, the re revisiting of simple problems still yield new results, and we will see it uh, very soon. Uh, but we consider is the simplest problem. Uh, so we assume that the particles are non-interacting particles. Why? Because this assumption allows us to focus on understanding the pure nature of quantum size and shape effects. Another assumption uh, is uh, our boundaries uh, are represented by infinite well potential. Uh, it is the simplest model, but uh, it allows us to maximize size and shape effects and investigate their ultimate contributions to thermodynamic state functions. And uh, finally, what we assume, we assume that we have sufficiently large number of particles to use statistical methods safely, or we have to uh, assume that uh, our system is ergodic, so time averages are a cubed ensemble average. In that case, even we can uh, consider a system with one particle, it doesn't matter. Uh, but if we want to have enough uh, number of particles in our system, then we have to at least uh, choose uh, one of the sizes of the domain is long enough or the density of particles is high enough. So let's start by considering a rectangular box and non-interacting particles confined in it. So these are the lengths, L1, L2, L3. Uh, these are the sizes of the boxes. And what we want to 
uh, calculate is the thermodynamic properties of these gases. So it is the simplest problem in statistical mechanics course. So as you know, uh, if you know one of the thermodynamic state functions, you can calculate the others from that one. It's very quickly and easily. So I choose free energy, uh, my target state function. So I will calculate free energy and uh, then I will calculate all others from free energy. So free energy in a Maxwellian statistics uh, is given by this simple uh, expression where this zeta is called single particle partition function because we are considering non-interacting particles. So it is very simple. And uh, these, this is the uh, energy eigenvalues of particles. Uh, and we can obtain these energy eigenvalues by solving sh uh, stationary Schrodinger equation, which is the very basic uh, problem in all quantum mechanic books and statistical thermodynamic books. So if you solve it, you get this trivial ex uh, expression. And uh, do you hear me, by the way? <laughs> yeah, Hello? yeah, we are hearing uh, okay. you. Okay. Without any problem. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, We're hearing you. Okay. So since I don't see you, so I have no uh, idea uh, since internet connection is still uh, uh, okay or not. So this is why I, time to time, I need to ask. Uh, okay. Thank you. So uh, this is uh, a very simple. Uh, uh, energy eigenvalue expression of uh, non-interacting particles. And as you know, the I1, I2, and I3 are the quantum state variables running from one to infinity. They are integer numbers. And you can easily reorganize uh, this expression in, uh, uh, in, uh, in this form, uh, where we call uh, alphas uh, as confinement parameters, and they are just uh, C over Li, Li are just L1, L2, and L3. And Lc here is the most, uh, half of the most probable de Broglie wavelength of unbounded particles. So it is very simple with these confinement parameters, and it reflects, uh, it represents uh, the strength of the confinement of the system. If it is uh, get bigger and bigger, it means that it is uh, uh, confined uh, uh, strongly. So then our main target is to calculate these summations because then uh, our partition function can be written in this uh, form. It's very simple. Uh, it is just a multiplication of uh, uh, single particle partitions in each direction. So in macroscopic thermodynamics, we can easily replace the summations with integrals, right? Because what we say we say uh, uh, in macroscopic scale, uh, our confinement parameters are extremely small because LC, as I said, it, it is uh, in the order of the Broglie wavelength of particles, which is very tiny length. Uh, if you are considering a macroscopic system, this is a huge number, the sizes of the box. So then alphas is very small. Since it is very small, uh, although our... Uh, quantum state variables uh, are integer numbers and change uh, in these integer numbers are equal to one. Uh, the change in uh, our exponential function becomes extremely smooth. So we can use easily integral approach and calculate these summations by integrals. But in nanoscale, uh, these confinement parameters are not much smaller than one. So then we have to find another way to calculate these infinite summations. There are different methods in literature to calculate these infinite sums. One of them are uh, summation formulas like Poisson, Ehlers Maclaurin, or Abel Plana. Uh, and we use Poisson summation formula. They are all equivalent to each other, actually. And what Poisson summation formula says us, uh, it says that if this function is symmetric, which is uh, the case here, uh, it is equal to integral of the function 
and then this corresponds of course to conventional integral term uh, which we do in macroscopic scale and then uh, a second term comes uh, it is called zero correction term and then uh, we have third term the it is called a discrete correction term when we apply this Poisson summation formula to our uh, partition function then we get this uh, uh, results so here we see uh, the bulk term uh, weighted for macroscopic systems but then we have one over two term here and then we have another summation uh, discrete correction if you look at their contributions so this blue curve shows the error of uh, the first term if you look at that, this is uh, the ratio of the first term to the correct summation value. So it gives a terrible result, actually, if we consider uh, big values of confinement. Uh, it gives only true results if alpha really very close, uh, alpha is very, very close to uh, zero. So at macroscopic scale, it is fine, but at uh, nanoscale, we have to consider the second one uh, in order to uh, uh, predict uh, the true behavior of this summation. Because uh, together with the second one, first and the second one, predict quite well, uh, and there is no error at all, uh, nearly uh, up to 1.2 value of confinement parameter. But then, uh, these first two terms of Poisson summation formula start to fail. Uh, but luckily, uh, only the first term of the, uh, our partition function uh, start to represent uh, the behavior of this summation uh, quite well. So uh, what we do, what we can do, we can use first two terms of Poisson summation, uh, summation formula uh, till uh, a high confinement values and then if the confinement goes uh, further and stronger then we can just use uh, the first term of uh, partition function so if we use first two terms of uh, Poisson summation formula we get this free energy expression so what what you see here the first term is the classical free energy term this is weighted for macroscopic systems but then we get these uh, additional terms, which are uh, here just because of the second term of Poisson summation formula. So what we did, we calculate the summation a little bit more precisely, and then we get these uh, terms here. So this is called quantum surface energy. This one is called quantum peripheral energy. By the way, the P here is not pressure but the periphery of the, uh, of the domain, the total peripheral length of the domain. So, and V here is the number of vertices. Uh, in our case, it is eight, just because we have eight kernels. So this is called quantum vertices energy uh, because they are proportional to surface area, peripheral uh, length, and the number of vertices. If you do the same calculations for other thermodynamic quantities you get these expressions so now we have some additional terms for all thermodynamic state functions so together with these terms they are valid in nanoscale as well but uh, of course they become uh, uh, unimportant uh, or negligible when you go to macro scale because a over v value or p over v value uh, and so on becomes uh, uh, smaller and smaller when volume uh, when the size of the domain uh, becomes bigger and bigger so uh, if you do the same calculations uh, for uh, cylindrical or spherical domains uh, you get also some solutions and if you do the same things for some different uh, domains where only numerical solutions are possible, uh, uh, even this type of uh, arbitrary shape, you can do that. You get the same free energy expression. This is a little bit weird. And uh, 
it says us that this free energy expression uh, doesn't depend on the shape of the domain. I mean, it depends on the shape, but it is a universal uh, expression. So uh, all the information about shape and size represented by A, P, and MB, that's all. So as long as you know the surface area, peripheral length, and number of vertices of the domain, you can express your free energy in this form. This is a universal. It looks universal at least. So you may ask, is it a coincidence? And the answer uh, uh, is no. It is not a coincidence. And there is a way to prove that it is a universal expression. And instead of summing over the quantum state variables, we may also do the same calculations by summing over the energy eigenvalues. But then we need density of state function, right? Uh, for density of state function, there is a very, uh, very good conjecture in literature, actually. Uh, Hermann Weyl did a conjecture uh, for the asymptotic behavior of eigenvalues of Laplace Bartrami operator and our uh, stationary uh, Schrodinger equation. Uh, is, uh, also belongs to that uh, class. And if you calculate the number of uh, eigenvalues of a stationary uh, Schrodinger equation, he says that number of states should be proportional to uh, uh, all these terms. What he say? He says. Uh, it should be proportional with not only the volume of the domain, but also with the uh, area, peripheral length, and the number of vertices of the domain. This is an amazing formula, actually, because up to him, uh, the people were just using this term. And in statistical mechanic course, I'm sure that you already drive this equation, uh, and you know where it comes from. But what he say, uh, he say uh, this is not alone. Uh, there are some other terms. And when you know this uh, number of states, what we call veil number of states formula, then you can easily calculate veil density of states. Uh, this is uh, what we call continuous density of states for three-dimensional uh, domains. But now we have, as I said, uh, some other terms. Let me go a little bit further. Uh, after Wales' uh, conjecture, uh, it is proven by Victor Erie in 1980s. So after uh, almost 70 years, uh, it is proven. Uh, but uh, it is also interesting for me to see that there are some uh, people from Uppsala University who work on the same problem, actually. But anyway. Uh, if you calculate the veil density of states for different uh, dimensions, you can see we have always some other terms, uh, additional terms, which represent quantum size effects uh, on density of state functions. So, uh, quantum size effects on thermodynamic properties can op be obtained by using either veil conjecture or Poisson summation formula. But veil conjecture, of course, allows you to generalize the results because wave conjecture is valid for arbitrary uh, uh, domains. So uh, in both ways, you get the same result. So we are now sure that, and mathematically we can prove that, this expression is a universal expression valid for any shape. So, but we may ask, and we should ask, but what are the physical origins of these terms? Why they are here? Uh, how they come there? And what they represent physically, I mean. What kind of physical mechanisms are behind them? So, if you want to answer these questions, uh, neither Poisson summation formula nor wave conjecture can help you. Because up to now, we just use mathematical formalism and get these results, that's all. So uh, then we have to look at more closely to the problem. Now uh, I will talk about the third methodology. 
what we propose uh, into literature as quantum boundary layer approach. So if you consider uh, Hamel's free energy uh, of a confined system, uh, of course, consists of uh, non-interacting particles, we have this expression, but uh, because of the properties of logarithm function, you can easily reorganize it like this, right? You just uh, put them all together. And then we have here volume times something. And uh, if you multiply uh, these uh, things, you can see expression like this. Volume minus surface area times delta plus peripheral length times delta square and so on. So what we call this effective volume because it is the volume minus some other volumes. Small volumes, but uh, these are in the dimension of volumes. So uh, what we call effective volume. And, of course, effective volume is, is sm always smaller than the apparent volume or geometric volume. Then uh, we can say, uh, instead of using the apparent density, we can uh, define effective density because now we use effective uh, volume instead of apparent volume. So then, just by using, by, just by exchanging classical density or apparent density, with the effective one, you can immediately uh, obtain these quantum size effect terms from the uh, classical free energy expression. So if you use this expression uh, into, uh, to here, then you, you can get these expressions. Uh, so what we say, you don't need to solve Schrodinger equation, you don't need to use summation, Poisson summation formula, and you don't need to use a uh, wave conjecture either. So you just have to accept that we need an effective volume and it is given uh, like this. So, but then we may ask what is effective volume? Why we can't use uh, apparent volume and we have to use effective volume in nanoscale? So in order to answer this question, we have to go a little bit uh, further. But let me say, for 1D case, for example, uh, instead of effective volume, we have effective length, which is uh, the apparent length minus 2 delta, because we have here 1 delta and 1 delta. And in 2D, we just have to use effective sizes in each direction, then we get effective surface area. And in the 3D case, again, the same. We have to use effective lengths in each direction, we get the same expression. So, but what is this delta? So it's a magic number there, uh, length scale, and it is uh, equal to one fourth of thermal de Broglie wavelength. Uh, but where it comes from? Why, uh, as I said before, we can't use the apparent lengths, but instead we have to use effective lengths, which are apparent length minus 2 delta, where it comes from. So let's go a little bit further and uh, look at the local density distribution. And this black curve shows uh, the local density distribution uh, in a dimensionless uh, form, actually. This is this x tilde is the x coordinate over the length of the, uh, the domain. Now, uh, I just look at one dimensional problem, just to make the problem simple. And here uh, we are looking for dimensionless density, which is the de true density over the classical density. And classical density is, of course, uh, can be calculated by using the number of particles times uh, classical probability, uh, probability dance, uh, density. Classical, yes, probability density, one over V. But in order to calculate uh, true uh, density, particle density, you have to use uh, quantum mechanical probability density, and then you get this expression, and then you get this black curve. In classical picture, our density distribution is homogeneous. We know it from classical thermodynamics, because at equilibrium, density has to be constant everywhere, homogeneous, because otherwise uh, the particles 
uh, flow from high uh, density region to low density region and equalize the density distribution. And finally, we get again flat uh, density distribution. But in, and in quantum picture, uh, it says us this is not uh, true, actually. Because of wave character of particles, part, uh, particles try to stay away from the boundaries and accumulate in the inner region of the domain, which makes the density higher than the classical one. So then it explains uh, something. And if we uh, try to calculate the thickness of this boundary layer, we have to, we have to uh, establish a recipe. And now we establish a recipe and we say that let's assume a uniform density at the uh, uniform density which has the same magnitude uh, with the true density here, this uh, red dotted uh, distribution is our uh, approximation. Uh, but now, in order to give the same domain integral values, we have to accept that there are some empty regions near to boundaries. And this way, we can calculate the thickness of these boundary layers. So we have higher uh, densities than the classical one uh, and completely empty regions near to boundaries. So this is a simplified true density distribution, let's say. In that way, if we calculate uh, the thickness of these boundary layers, we get the same result, one-fourth of the time of the wavelength. Uh, this is dimensionless one. This is why we have here one over L. Uh, and it is in, uh, also possible to see that when Planck's constant goes to zero, this quantum boundary layer disappears. So we total uh, we recover uh, the classical expressions uh, uh, when we go to classical limit so it is uh, it is safe so what we can say particles occupy a smaller volume than the apparent one as we see here so then the effective length is just l minus 2 delta so now we understand uh, why we have L minus 2 delta in our previous expressions. So then it is easy to calculate effective volume and the effective density. So with this uh, third method, what we call quantum boundary layer approach, you don't need to solve Schrodinger equation. You don't need to use Poisson summation or wave conjecture, or even you don't need to calculate partition function. You just need classical or trivial conventional ex thermodynamic expressions, but only uh, what, what you need is only to use effective density instead of classical one. Then you get the true expressions immediately. So then you have to accept uh, the existence of the th uh, quantum boundary layer. This is a kind of uh, effective mass concept in solid state physics. So once you uh, accept uh, and use it, everything becomes very easy. So quantum boundary layer approach allows uh, to make physical explanations for the mechanism of quantum size effects on thermodynamics. So let me go a little bit uh, faster. How many minutes I have? Um, okay. Well, um... Uh, how many minutes do you need? <laughs> I mean, what is the time there? I couldn't see. It's it's, a, it's six six o five p.m. Oh, here in Colombia, here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so it's yeah, it's noon. It's five okay. past noon. So I use uh, thirty six minutes then. Uh, we started at half past uh, eleven, I guess, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay. no, okay. just, yeah, yeah, just keep on going, no problem. Okay, I hope I will uh, complete uh, on time. Uh, okay. So, if we look at uh, the, the true free energy expression, we can uh, arrange the, the same expression in this form as well. What we see here is the effective pressure 
So this is very uh, trivial pressure expression, NKT. But instead of classical or apparent density, we use effective density, and then we get effective pressure. And what uh, what is this? This is volume minus effective volume, which is the depleted volume, actually. So this is the depletion work. So then everything becomes very clear. Uh, in nanoscale thermodynamics, uh, all these terms uh, comes from the depletion work, actually. This is because... Uh, uh, because of the uh, wave nature of particles, they are uh, trying to stay away from the boundaries and they deplate uh, these regions and the depleted work is just uh, appear uh, in free energy expression. So now we can understand uh, the physical mechanism of quantum size effects in thermodynamics. And let me go further and talk about uh, some corollaries of these uh, additional terms. In classical picture, uh, uh, the pressure of a classical gas actually is a scalar quantity, right? It is given by NKT. But if you consider uh, these additional terms, we have some uh, additional term uh, in pressure expression as well. And uh, for example, if you consider the pressure in uh, direction one, you have an additional term uh, here. Uh, and if you consider helium-4 gas at room temperature and atmospheric pressure, and if the size of the box is 10 nanometer, then uh, this pressure correction is uh, 205 Pascal. Uh, sorry, 250 Pascal. Uh, so if your system or domain is an anisometric domain, then the pressure is also anisometric, an, an, anisotropic. So then uh, the pressure in each direction becomes different. In other ways, uh, in other words, uh, at macro scale, pressure is a scalar quantity. But in nanoscale, even the pressure of a classical ideal gas becomes a tensorial quantity because of this uh, quantum size effects. So what else? Well, we can uh, we can consider, for example, a box separated by a permeable wall and filled by a helium three and helium four mixture, and then uh, consider the thermodynamic equilibrium. Uh, what our uh, classical expectation says us, and the expressions also says us. If the temperatures are equal and the chemical potentials are equal, which is the case for thermodynamic equilibrium, and the, the chemical potential expression says that the, uh, the densities should be equal to each other. So in equilibrium, densities of helium-4 and 3 should be equal to helium-4 and 3 here. But in nanoscale, or if you consider quantum size effects, we have an additional term here which says us the densities are not equal to each other, even at equilibrium. So in other words, if we force the densities equal to each other, then diffusion through a permeable wall uh, results, which might be called a size-dependent diffusion. So uh, in classical picture, uh, density difference is the driving force for diffusion process. But in nanoscale, size difference also becomes a driving force for diffusion process. If we use this phenomena, then we can enrich uh, the isotopes. For example, if you uh, consider helium-4 and 3 mixture at room temperature, and if, uh, if the size of your narrow uh, box is uh, around 10 nanometer, then you get uh, these amount of uh, concentrations uh, differences at mac uh, macroscopic part. This is microscopic or nano, uh, nano, nano scale part of the box. This is the macro scale part of the box. So if you mix helium dirt and helium four and helium three, and then wait for a while, then you get uh, different concentration at the right hand side. So. Another 
results of quantum size effects in thermodynamic uh, nanoscale thermodynamics is uh, is this effect actually if you have a box filled by particles and you if you have a movable wall with infinitely uh, I mean infinitely thin movable wall uh, normally you expect a zero force acting on it because since it is infinitely thin, uh, its uh, cross-section uh, is zero. But because of the existence of quantum boundary layer, uh, its effective thickness becomes two delta. And then if you really uh, take the derivative of free energy with respect to Ls, uh, this uh, size of the movable wall, then you get a force and you can easily calculate this force just by the pressure times the effective thickness of the wall. Uh, so if you do that for helium-4 at room temperature, you can get 2.5 piconewton if the length is one micrometer. Uh, so up to now, I try to explain how uh, quantum size effects uh, appear uh, uh, in thermodynamic uh, state functions. Uh, I would like to say a few more things about quantum shape effects. And uh, these results are mainly based on Alhun's PhD uh, work. Uh, so I would like to thank him uh, once again for his great work. So we already published uh, some articles. Uh, you can find the details there. But I just would like to uh, give you some uh, uh, short results, let's say. In macroscopic scale, uh, as we already know, thermodynamic state functions depend on two uh, state variables, like temperature and density. And as we uh, already saw now, at nanoscale, uh, the state functions also depends on size. But what about shape? So we ask if shape uh, can also be, uh, become a control parameter on uh, state functions and how it uh, works. Uh, let, let me talk about a little bit uh, about this problem. So uh, what we do, we consider uh, Korsha structures. Here we have a, a rectangular box and another rectangular box in it. And in between this rectangular box, we have a cavity. So you can put your uh, particles in it. This can be a cavity for atomistic gas or a, a, a semiconductor or metallic material. So uh, it may contain uh, electron gas as well. So what we do, we keep the whole whale parameters constant. So volume, surface area, peripheral lengths, and number of vertices or uh, kerners remain constant, but, but uh, we just change the rotation of the inner square, like here, and ask if something uh, changed, uh, if something happened in thermodynamic state functions. These are the density distributions. I will not talk about uh, them uh, at the moment to save some time. So what we do, we calculate the partition function uh for the particles confined in this box and uh, change the orientation angle of inner square uh, every time uh, and then calculate the partition again and again and then what we see we see that the partition function actually changes uh, with the rotation angle with the configuration so here we see uh, the partition function over its value for zero configuration, uh, zero degree configuration angle. So what we see here, we see a, uh, there is a 80 per, uh, eight percent uh, difference uh, because of the rotation. So during the rotation, none of the size parameters change. So wave conjecture cannot predict the change in partition due to rotation. So we have something else here. And uh, if we calculate uh, other thermodynamic properties uh, like free energy, 
at least focus on just the black curve, not the, the other ones. Uh, we see that free energy also changed with uh, uh, the shape. And also we see the similar behavior in entropy. Here, the blue line or uh, straight line uh, represent the wave conjecture. So the wave conjecture doesn't say anything about this kind of change. But our quantum boundary layer approach luckily uh, predict uh, these kind of changes even in uh, even in this problem actually quantum shape uh, effect problem so if we look at internal energy and uh, heat capacity uh, just focus on this black curve because black curve represents the correct results the red ones are just the predictions of our quantum boundary layer approach and the blue ones, as I said, they conjecture it says nothing. So what we see here, uh, quantum boundary layer approach predicts these kind of uh, variations uh, quite well, actually. Uh, but because of this shape dependency, now instead of uh, two-dimensional thermodynamic uh, state space, we have six-dimensional thermodynamic state space. So instead of V and T, we are we have more control parameters on thermodynamic state functions like a p and d and also now theta uh, if you do the similar calculations for different uh, domains you get the similar shape dependency they are different from each other uh, in detail but uh, uh, more or less uh, they behave in the same manner let's say so uh, since free energy changes with the orientation uh, it predicts a mechanical torque as well because uh, actually the mechanical torque you can easily calculate just by derivative by just by taking the derivative of free energy with respect to uh, angular configuration and times minus and you get some mechanical torque and just because of the wave character of particles now we have a, a mechanical torque this looks like a spring so if you leave uh, the system uh, in this position it eventually uh, turns into this position because this is the this position uh, is the minimum free energy position so uh, I don't want to talk about the details of uh, the physical mechanism uh, to save some time. But because of this new behavior, a uh, shape dependency, you can even uh, propose completely new thermodynamic cycles, which uh, never, uh, never be considered uh, in thermodynamic uh, thermodynamics before uh, here we see a, a iso uh, a new thermodynamic cycle based on isothermal process what we do here we consider uh, this kind of domain filled by particles as i said before this can be electrons as well uh, you don't have to think always atomic uh, particles but you can consider semiconductors and electrons and so on what we do we just warm it up and then uh, during this process we keep the shape constant so this is why we call isothermal process because we keep the shape constant increase the temperature and then from here to here we just rotate the inner square from 45 degree to zero degree uh, at constant temperature, two to three. Uh, during this process, we have to give some work because as we see before, this is the minimum free energy position. So you have to do some work in order to turn it uh, uh, from this angle to this angle. So you do work, you give uh, heat energy uh, because you increase also the entropy. Uh, and then what uh, what we do, we decrease the temperature by keeping the, the, the shape of the domain constant again at this position. 
and then uh, we reject the heat to the cold reservoir and came to the starting point. So we then define a new thermodynamic cycle to isothermal to isothermal processes. And here we see the torque versus uh, orientation angle diagram. Uh, and we see that uh, the torque at low temperature is higher than the torque uh, at uh, higher temperature. This is actually the opposite behavior uh, what we see in classical picture. So because of the wave nature, of course, uh, the, 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 the particles wave nature becomes important at cold temperature. So this is why we get more torque than, uh, than that we get at high temperature. So but at the end, by following these uh, points, we can get net amount of work from the cycle. And then we have a new thermodynamic cycles. We can propose it. So let me say a few more things. I have only two or three slides more. Uh, because of these effects, we can propose what we call thermosize effects and what we call thermoshape effects. Professor, so, Professor Fishman. Yes. yes. Just, uh, just take your time. Don't worry. So there's, there's yes. no rush. Okay. So, so, so we can, so we can finish it up. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So just, I have three more slides. That's all. Uh, <clears throat> what we did together with Alhun and Jonas Franson uh, from Uppsala University, from the same department, colleague, uh, we consider a, a, a graphene nanoribbon. Uh, one is uh, thinner, one is uh, thinner, thicker and thinner. So the, uh, we put them together under a temperature gradient. And just because of the uh, quantum size effects, you can induce an electrochemical potential difference. Uh, so in uh, what I mean, you can convert uh, heat energy into electrical energy just by using uh, size effects in thermodynamics because the chemical potential gradient here is different than the chemical potential gradient here. So at the end, you get, uh, and the, uh, since they are uh, connected to each other by a conductor at the cold end, uh, the chemical potentials should, should be acute to each other at the cold end. But since the gradients are different, uh, at the uh, hot end, uh, the electrochemical potentials become different. And then you get this uh, electrochemical potential differences uh, for 10 Kelvin uh, difference uh, for different uh, GNRs. Uh, I just want to uh, share with you that you can induce electrochemical potential difference just because of what we talked before. So uh, here, what we, we, we published it last year, uh, this is thermoshape effect. We propose a new effect uh, for thermoelectric phenomena. And uh, here, we, what we propose, we propose to consider the same materials with the same size, but different shapes. As we saw before, because of the shape differences, their thermodynamic properties and also transport properties, of course, become different. And because of that, the chemical potential gradient here uh, is different than uh, that of here. And these temperature gradients, the same temperature gradients, cause different chemical potential gradients just because of the shape difference. And then at the end, uh, we get electrochemical potential difference uh, in between these two terminals just because of the shape difference. So this is why we call thermal shape effect because we need shape difference and temperature difference to induce this electrical potential difference. So here we see uh, some values, but they are not important at the moment. I just want to uh, show you that we can induce uh, an electrical potential just because of shape difference. Uh, so uh, as a last word, 
uh, I would like to say like in general relativity. Geometry rules the thermodynamic behaviors in nanoscale. So from macro scale to nanoscale, geometry control many things actually. So by the way, uh, thanks to Eklid, uh, who is assumed to be the father of geometry. So uh, I would like to thank you very much for your kind invitation and attention. So thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Altu. It was a pleasure to um, to be able to listen to you once more. I've been in uh, uh, this is I think the fourth talk of yours that I attend. So they're always very nice. Thank you very much. So I would like to start with the questions from one of our um, students in the course of statistical mechanics. She had to leave, but she uh, just wrote down some questions in the chat. So I'm going to read them to you to see if you can uh, try to respond some of them or all of them if you want. Let me see. So, so the first one, you can see what happened to the free energy if we only consider the shape or the size effect. You see that one? Yes, what happened means, I mean, as I showed uh, you, uh, let me, let me go uh, to the, uh, let me, let me check first the whole questions and then uh, talk about them uh, on the, the presentations, okay? Okay. So, uh, what happened to free energy if we only consider only shape or size? Apparently, you saw the size and uh, we saw the quantum effects, but it's the most prom effect of this. Yes. The second question, the most prom uh, predominant effect uh, are uh, size effects, actually. Uh, and shape effects uh, are a little bit, uh, in comparison with the size effect, uh, shape effects are a little bit tiny effects. Uh, and my last question is, could you uh, bring to us a few example systems in which we can solve this phenomena? Yes, uh, as I showed you, uh, uh, we already published two articles uh, about thermal size and thermal shape effects. Uh, there you can see uh, uh, the examples of uh, these effects, actually. Uh, and let me turn back to the first question, free energy. We consider only shape. Yes. Okay. Let me share. Again. Do you see my screen again? Not yet. Yeah. Okay. So. For example, here. Um, of, I, I yes. can I can see your screen. Really? So can, can can you try again, please? Yes. Share. And then now. Uh, it's on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it's a good question actually. Uh, uh, these are very special configurations just to keep the size effects constant and focus on or consider uh, the, the, only the shape effects. These kind of special configurations, Cauchy structures, allow us to keep these size effects constant and see, uh, uh, see pure quantum shape effects. This is why uh, this wave conjecture uh, predict uh, constant uh, values uh, for different thermodynamic uh, quantities. Uh, so the wave conjecture doesn't see any change, but we see here some change. For example, if we look at specific heat, what we see uh, is 12 percent change because of the uh, quantum shape effects. But uh, you can see uh, the other thermodynamic properties as well, of course, but uh, they are all in the same order, 10%, 8%, 4%, or 
eight percent again. Uh, but if you go to quantum size effects, then uh, it depends on uh, the order of magnitude of uh, these ratios. Let me see. Let me go to pre-energy expression, then, yes, this one's, yes. So, then it depends on uh, these ratios, actually. Here we have also uh, volume uh, at the denominator, because we, here we have density, so it is n over v, so we have always uh, surface area over volume, periphery over volume, like here. So if this term becomes bigger and bigger, then uh, the size effects becomes bigger and bigger. Uh, and if this term becomes bigger than this term, then uh, your system uh, uh, changed its dimension from three-dimensional uh, behavior to completely two-dimensional behavior. So then you have to keep these two constant and then change these ones it's a little bit complicated, but uh, here we see just the quantum size effect, effects. So you can play uh, with these terms to see how they contribute to the bulk terms. Uh, and then you can go to here to shape effects. And then you can change uh, only the uh, orientation angle to see how uh, shape effects uh, change or how much uh, quantum shape effects change thermodynamic state functions. Uh, so, uh, and for the other ones, you can just look at this one for other question. I mean, uh, this one and that one. There you can see quantum size and shape effects uh, on uh, both thermodynamic and uh, mostly transport properties of uh, here gallium arsenide, there uh, here uh, you can see the uh, quantum size effects on uh, transport properties of uh, graphene nanoribbons. So uh, size effects and shape effects. So this is my answer, I hope uh, I answer your questions. Yeah, so the the video response will be available for students. So then um, Sasiri, which is the student who asked, he will be able to review your replies. So I think we'll be okay. Mm -hmm. So um, is there any question from the rest of the audience that Somebody will might to. Mm, I have a little question. Okay, Halil, go ahead. Okay. Thank you. First of all, thank you, you. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was uh, very interesting to see how the quantum boundary layer approach allow you to precise the physics behind the effective density in terms of the wave behavior and allow you to find these types of new cycles uh, in a very intuitive way. My question basically is related with the validity, with the validity and the generality of these approximations. Yeah. Because when we have, for example, density functions that are very sharp at the edge, or for example, including an external potential or including an interaction, uh, uh, in this type of cases, the approach has many flaws, or I imagine that I must uh, be adapted to the geometry of the material uh, under considerations. Um, or even at less general formulas, uh, I am not sure, but um, you understand my question? Yes, exactly. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, very nice question. and. Uh, Actually, we uh, also did, uh, we also uh, extend uh, this quantum boundary layer approach to Fermi and Bose cases. And uh, as you said, uh, you are right. Uh, in, for example, in Fermi case, uh, since the 
the local density oscillates because of radial oscillations, uh, especially near to boundaries, you, you have no smooth density distribution, but instead you have a fluctuating uh, density distribution. Uh, but we are able to uh, define uh, quantum boundary layer, the thickness of quantum boundary layer in terms of temperature for Maxwell in case, but in Fermi case, for example, or in Bose case, in terms of a chemical potential or density, and also in a very strong confinement case, uh, the size of the domain actually. So in general, uh, what, I, uh, what I showed you today, uh, thickness of quantum boundary layer in Maxwellian case depends on only temperature, right? Uh, but this is not the case, actually, in, uh, if we want to generalize the, the, the methodology. Uh, if we consider uh, this idea in Fermi or Bose or in quantum statistics, for example, then uh, we get more general uh, functionality, uh, which make quantum boundary layer depend on temperature, density, and also uh, the size of the domain. Uh, then uh, your boundary layers start to oscillate, for example, in Fermi case, uh, when you decrease the size of the domain, uh, your, the, the thickness of quantum boundary layers start to oscillate, and then you can predict the true behavior, uh, for example, through behavior of uh, specific heats or entropy where you observe oscillatory behaviors. Uh, so we can extend the idea, but if you ask me, can we extend it for uh, interacting gas, then uh, I have no answer at the moment uh, because I need some uh, new perspectives to extend uh, this uh, quantum boundary layer idea for interacting mm -hmm. gas uh, we need some uh, some new ideas actually i don't know whether i uh, reply uh, your question okay halil do you want to reply um no no thank you very much for your instructive answer thank you thank you but okay. let me let me say one more things uh, by using the density functional theory, if you give us uh, the density distribution, local density distribution in a domain, then we are always, I mean, by considering, of course, the interactions. And so you can do lots of things by using density functional theory. So uh, since you are able to do many things by considering uh, this uh, DFT or finite temperature DFT even, uh you can give us the the local density distribution if you give us this one this local density distribution then we can calculate quantum boundary layer thickness then we can get all the results even for interacting gas well i, I would like to, to say something about it i i really think for the for the, let's say the second part of the replay because i was almost to ask the same so if i provide you of the local density, then then you can give me which will be this thickness of the quantum boundary layer. Then, yes, so exactly. exactly. Okay, so right. because we can do that, for example, numerically, we can obtain numerically exact the uh, density uh, profile of a quantum interacting system. And okay, so that is quite interesting. Actually, it's pretty interesting for us that we are actually working with interacting systems. That's why. The guys are, work, are asking about that. Okay, yeah, th thanks a lot. Th th thank you very much uh, as well. Yeah, as, as long as we get uh, some results from you, uh, then uh, we can easily adapt uh, your results into this kind of problems uh, via quantum boundary layer approach. Thanks. That's pretty cool, actually. Thank you. Okay, so um, I'll talk. I would like to um, 
Mm, I would like to mm, make a comment. So I would say that um, with respect to the density functional part, mm -hmm. so one, th this is very material specific. So, um, so well, I know that the, the people there in Rajib's group and stuff like that, they like to say that there's uh, finite temperature DFT, mm -hmm. but that's actually imprecise because it's a finite temperature correction to DFT. So DFT is a zero temperature theory. Yes. yes but yes, yes. but then you can correct uh, using uh, um, the perturbation theory. You can add corrections for uh, polynomial corrections for uh, polynomial uh, temperatures. So that's one thing. And the other thing is that when you have magnetism and superconductivity, so then this is, which are strong, which are theories that come from strong correlations. So this is uh, like increasing, increasingly difficult to actually uh, correct density functional theory for this, for, for instance. So density functional theory uh, does not predict by itself. So you have to add stuff like for instance, DFT plus U or DFT plus Sigma plus U to actually mm -hmm. find the ground state of a magnetic material. So then, and you cannot find ground states of superconductors with DFT. So then this is um, um, like a tricky part, but I would say that for the materials in which uh, DFT can predict the ground state more or less well. Mm -hmm. So I think you will be able to get the density to actually uh, apply to the, to the bond, quantum boundary layer approach. Mm -hmm. This is mm -hmm. uh, like my, my, what I was going to comment on. Uh -huh. then, so, so you suggest to consider uh, zero temperature uh, density distribution uh, based on the functional theory first. Uh, and then uh, look at if we can predict some material properties by using quantum boundary layer approach based on uh, DFT, uh, right? And you can add, of course, you can always add the corrections, like this uh, corrections DFT plus U plus Sigma, KKR, which is the uh, Green's function method for DFT, and so forth and so on. And of course, if you're in, 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 in like magnetic materials, which are perhaps, so the magnetism of dysprosium, gadolinium, and terbium, which are the three, these three uh, strange metals, which I believe Alhun is working on this. But then these ones, you need relativistic DFT to actually predict uh, the ground state. So it's not conventional, but relativistic DFT. Professor Peter Opener, he has done some work on this, which mm -hmm. he, he knows everything about everything. So then but he knows a lot about this. So um, so this is just the comment that I uh, was going to, to make. I, I, have, I have a question, but I will leave it for the end because this, uh, I, it, it uh, involves your work and Alhun's work. So I will wait until the last minute. So is there any other question around? Well, I, 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 I do have that. one, but I don't know. Okay, Halil, go ahead first, and then I go after. Okay, thank you, thank you. Um, my question is basically a curiosity, and I related with the uh, topological materials. I don't know if we have also a form to think these phenomena uh, of the topology in terms of a classical uh, effective density, like this type of approach. I don't know if you or if you don't have any connections with with this type of phenomena. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's a very nice question, actually. Uh, but I should say uh, I have no idea because uh, uh, we didn't work on uh, that kind of problems yet. Uh, Alun, uh, would you like to say something or uh, prefer to? Uh, not to say um i think this is a very good question but uh i also don't have any answer uh for it um with the i mean with this formalism that we considered uh it might not be applicable to the uh materials with topological properties directly so we might need to consider some other characteristics of the system 
Uh, but uh, that's, I mean, I don't have a like concrete uh, opinion on that. Mm -hmm. But it's a very good question, actually, and uh, we may we may look at that actually if it works there, if something new there. Uh, so thank you, thank you for your question. Thanks, thanks to you. Okay, Professor Karin, it's your turn. Okay, thank you. Um, I I just would like to point out a little bit about this. Um, uh, about the partition function. So when you were commenting us about the po Poissonian summation formula that leave us with the first term or the consideration of the first term of this partition summation formula um, due to the fact that uh, the confinement affects the problem, I, I was wondering myself what kind of criteria when it's a when it's left to you to, to use in order to know at nanoscale uh, how actually it works. So afterwards, you were commenting that uh, the vial conjecture will give us kind of of criteria. But uh, I I would like to know that I understood correctly that the vial conjecture will give us kind of criteria on mostly for size effects. But yes. the shape effects are not actually introduced in this kind of criteria. Yes, this this, this is true. Uh, yes, you are right. As you said, Bay conjecture doesn't predict uh, anything about shape effects. So this is okay. why we 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 were very happy because by using quantum boundary layer approach, we were able to predict even shape effects, not only size but also shape effects. So, uh, and explain the, the origins. I didn't mention the details, but you, you may find uh, the details uh, in our articles together with Alun. Uh, so we may even explain the whole strange behaviors in detail by using quantum boundary layer approach. Uh, so Veil vale doesn't say anything. But Could. Uh, yeah, okay. sorry. Go ahead, please. 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 <laughs> Me? Uh, okay, uh, thank you. But I just wanted to, to, to finish my question in the sense I'm that sorry. I would like to know whether this boundary, this quantum boundary layer approach, it's also allowed to use uh, at equal zero. So may I, sorry, may sorry, I consider I, I, I miss your I miss your last uh, sentence. Quantum boundary layer approach? It's able to, be, so we are able to use it at low, at, at low energies or low temperatures or mm, better to say at T equal to zero. No, so no, 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 no. Okay. You, you, you can use uh, at every temperature, actually. It is general. So you can use it uh, for room temperature and low temperature. But of course, if you go to low temperatures, then you should use uh, bose Einstein uh, statistics. Uh, there, uh, the, the thickness of quantum boundary layer becomes also depend on density. Uh, so we didn't publish it yet. But uh, to, probably together with Alhun, uh, we will publish two more articles about uh, QBL, quantum boundary layer approach, uh, in Fermi and both gases. Uh, so then uh, you may see there uh, how we can use them uh, even for both. For example, you, you can use it to explain uh, to make another explanation for Bose-Einstein condensation even. So we have different ideas, but uh, they are still in our mind. So we have to, uh, <laughs> we have to organize our ideas and uh, write the paper. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But since, um, since now for very confined systems, even though we could be at uh, T equals zero temperature, um, but the strong confinement allow us to have, uh, let's say, uh, chemical potential, effective chemical potential, effective uh, size, and so on and so forth. So it would mean that it would be allowed to consider zero, zero temperature thermodynamics, so to say? Uh, it's, I mean, at zero temperature, uh, what we expect, uh, uh, everything 
we go to ground state uh, properties and then uh, we recover just ground state uh, properties of thermodynamic system. Uh, yeah, true, but it's the confinement. You can make the, the confinement and since everything is then oh, yeah. density dependent and if you introduce interactions and stuff like that, then actually you may see that the properties, the, the properties can change if, for example, the geometry changes, yes. although we are at zero temperature. So it leads me to uh, a, a, a T equals zero thermodynamics. So it's quite cool, no? Yes. But, um, yes. but it's some, it sounds somehow strange. Yeah, very good uh, idea, actually. I didn't think uh, in that way. So it is, it is very good uh, uh, problem. It is the asymptotic case, actually, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for this idea, actually. Yeah, it's very <laughs> okay. good. <laughs> thank you. No, thanks to you, because actually your talk you. was uh, pretty clear and uh, and it allowed us to, to, to let our imagination just go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Professor Karin and Professor Altuk. Mm, is there any other question from the public? from the audience. Okay, so um, I don't know if uh, Al Alhun, is Alhun still awake? Yes, I am. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So um, I was um, going to, um, so in the course of statistical mechanics, um, um, so we happen to have some couple of very enthusiastic um, students uh, that um, might be interesting to calculate something in this direction. So then I was wondering, so when you calculate the resistance of uh, of a conventional metal, and when I mean conventional metal, I mean there's no um, strange excitations in the density of states, there's no plasmonic excitations or strong polar effects and stuff like that. So then, when you when you do this, you can actually um, evaluate the resistivity of a metal using Matheson's rule. See, so then um, I don't know if you you know about Matheson's rule, Alvin, don't you? Yeah. So sure. then, um, of course, um, this is this this is a limiting case, or a more general case, because you have to actually assume that the scattering times, or the relaxation times of um, electron electron scattering, electron vibration scattering, electron spin scattering electron impurity scattering, so they're actually independent of each other. So then, and of course, this is an approximated behavior. I was wondering, uh, of course, there's some, some, mm, some empirism that you can reproduce with this, but then uh, it, it led me to think that maybe from here, from our group, we can calculate uh, the corrections using the vial conjecture to this resistivity if, if, if that will make sense or not for a conventional metal. That's my first um, thought, because of course, when you calculate this um, relaxation times of these scattering processes, you do with the Sommerfeld approximation, you're not considering specific geometries, so specific mm, size and shape effects. You can do a lot of thermoelectricity with this. I'll send you my um, my lecture notes uh, after this meeting, so you can check a little bit um, what I'm referring to, even though we spoke about this last time, I remember. So, so can we do? Can we actually um, contribute to the enhancement of the prediction of resistivity of metals in this limit, if we consider the oil conjecture and the thermal and the, the size and shape effects? That's my first question, and my second question is. What is the what is the next step when you want to do with this for strange metals? So how do you do it for strange metals? I don't think you can use Boltzmann equation for strange metals. So what do you do? 
you will never know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's uh, that's very nice. Um, actually, um, Alto has um, be even before me um, has an article where they considered the transport properties under quantum size effects. So, to your first question, as long as you are considering um, materials where size effects are appreciable, size effects are dominant, uh, what I mean is probably you are at the nanoscale, and then you would need to consider uh, those corrections provided by well conjecture or Poisson summation formula and so on. So those corrections will be there and you need to consider them. Uh, of course, um, I mean, this is about at which scale you are, at which scale your electrons or in general charge carriers are. And that's for your first question. And the second one, so uh, yeah, I mean, um, Matthiessen rule, yes, you need uh, to you need to be able to separate all these scattering mechanisms independently. Um, in most cases, that works. There, there are systems where they they don't, of course. Um, but uh, Boltzmann equation can can be used, and all these scattering uh, rates can be used under quantum size effects. So. You can predict new um, corrections to the resistivity, and but I don't think they that will be new results because they are already already uh, shown, I guess. And even for the shape effects, for example, we have presented the transport properties are dependent to the quantum shape effects as well in our thermal shape uh, effect article. That was not the focus, of course, of that article, but um we have some results there but i mean it is open of course you can uh, discover um it more specifically in some materials by considering some other like interactions and so on these are all, all open and uh, un undiscovered yet there are things to uh, do that's for sure and for the strange metals um it is quite i mean uh, there are many, many people uh, talking uh, about uh, those materials, but I have read quite uh, a lot of articles in, my, in, in the last few months, and my conclusion is uh, nobody really uh, has an understanding of uh, those materials. So uh, there are several things that, um, there are several experiments that for sure uh, defines some some grounds, but uh, theoretically, it is really um, like a black box. So uh, there are things which suggests that, um, for example, in in a science article 2013, um, the researchers thought that the scattering rates are universal. Uh, for these strange metals, they obey to these uh, the quantum um, uh, scattering rate, which is Planck, uh, Planckian scattering rate or Planckian dissipation. Sometimes they call H bar over KBT, and this universal rate uh, it cannot be explained by any existing theory yet in condensed matter physics. And although these materials are uh, strongly correlated, people think that um, the scattering rate is universal and is a result of one mechanism that they didn't uh, make any sense of it yet. So even Matthias and Rule, I mean, uh, I mean, different scattering mechanisms might not be even apparent uh, even there at, uh, in those materials. But people think uh, electron electron interactions are the Dumb. key, yeah, key uh, to explain those behaviors. But still, uh, existing condensed matter theories don't have answer to that. That's why we are uh, looking from another uh, approach. 
uh, in this in in my new group. I hope this answers your question, Steve. Yeah, I just um, I would like to ask you about something you mentioned. So, well, what I want to do is to uh, with the students is perhaps to do a calculation to actually correct to a certain extent the predictions of the empirism of resistivity of metals. So then which is of the order of, uh, which is of the form of alpha t squared plus beta t to the power of five. So then, and the idea is of course to calculate alpha and beta or to predict with, with a, with a um, in a more, much more precise way. So then I didn't know that Alto was, uh, had done this. So basically um, what you have there in the calculation of resistivity is two important things that you just mentioned that you said that Alto had a paper on this in the past, which is the relaxation time for the scattering process. So that's one thing. And we need as well the density of states. So then, and when you have this, you use the summer film expansion, get some terms and get the contributions, blah, 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 to two dollars of some temperature. So my question is, uh, did you, Alto, did you evaluate the um, time relaxation uh, for the scattering uh, processes using the via conjecture there? I mean, how did you include size and shape effects in this time relaxation? Yeah, actually, we, in that article, we consider both diffusive and fully ballistic, not fully ballistic, but uh, semi-ballistic uh, regions as a two asymptotic cases. Uh, and then we didn't uh, look at the shape uh, effects on resistivity in that article, but together with Alhum, uh, in our recent article, we look at uh, the effect, uh, shape effects on uh, the conductance in gallium arsenide. But your idea actually is uh, is to extend uh, the the core idea into different. Uh, uh, I mean, what as I, as far as I understood, you are planning to apply the idea, uh, not only for resistivity, uh, but also for other quantities, uh, right? Uh, you may for, do it, for example, to calculate directly constant of materials uh, or optical properties, let's say uh, more general, or magnetic properties of materials uh, so uh, not only resistivity, but also uh, there are lots of transport properties. Uh, so th there you can uh, use wave conjecture or Poisson summation formula uh, and look at size and shape effects on, uh, let's say, for example, refractive index. You can calculate refractive index of materials and then look at how it changes with size, but it is probably already solved and already worked a lot uh, yeah. because of this metamaterial uh, uh, business. But uh, you may also look at how shape effect uh, changes a refractive index or dielectric constant or magnetic permeability and so on. So th this is a very open uh, field actually at the moment. You may uh, follow uh, Poisson summation formula by restricting yourself rectangular domains, or you can use wave conjecture and then choose uh, any type of uh, domains, whatever you want. Uh, but at the end, if you want to include the shape effects into account, you have to uh, either use our QB, uh, QBL approach or you have to calculate it numerically. Then, uh, then you can uh, you can see what happen if you consider shape effects. Uh, oh, okay. then, then you have to consider these Korsha structures. These are the key point, actually. Uh, uh, these Korsha structures uh, allow you to, to eliminate size effects and focus on only shape effects. Uh, because in literature, people talk about shape effects by considering rectangular and cylindrical uh, structures. But they are wrong because uh, mm -hmm. wave parameters change as surface areas are not the same and peripheral lengths are not the same. So they are already 
there are uh, lots of size effects there. The, so in order to eliminate all size effects and focus just uh, pure shape effects, you need these core si uh, core shell structures. Okay. Can David, you... you yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah, no, go ahead, Alvin. Uh, you, you mentioned that the um, temperature dependence of the resistivity, right? T squared plus T terms and so on. Yeah. Uh, in that case, you are planning to consider uh, the electron-electron and electron-phonon interactions uh, in yeah, your yeah. system. That's why yeah, you, 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 conventionally, you conventionally you do electron 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 impurity electron spin yeah. for instance for the condo model and you consider as well um, electron vibration or electron phonon that depends on what you're talking about so then and yeah. this gives and you can correct this to uh, you you get contributions to of the order of t square and t to the power of five so of course in that sense that you can reproduce the empirism but maybe the alpha and the beta constants are not uh, perfectly right. This is what mm -hmm. I meant. Yeah. So in that regard, uh, maybe um, size the contributions of size effect on each of those terms. Uh, for example, how size effect changes the electron-phonon interaction, electron-electron interaction, and so on. That might be uh, a valuable thing. Uh, which I didn't see in the literature uh, before, at least analytically or using these uh, formalisms. Maybe all two uh, will know, but I, I don't aware of any work um, considering this um, size effects under uh, interaction, those interactions, and maybe um, the, the validity of Matthiessen rules. Is it um, also the also valid under size effects, that also I don't uh, have any idea. I don't I know. Don't, yeah, I, I checked that a uh, couple of years ago and I didn't find like any uh, enthusiastic results. So then um, it will be nice, Alto, if you can send me that paper where you work this so I can okay. discuss with okay. my students. Sure. 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 So maybe I can remind you by email and yeah. uh, maybe <laughs> do that uh, if i don't send you uh, then please do that <laughs> okay i'll do so then uh, we have very uh, from the master course we only have oh we have just it and laura here so we will see you again later in the year for the um, graduate statistical mechanics course uh -huh. so then uh, in the um mm, but for the meantime, I will see if there is uh, another question, and uh, um, and otherwise we can just um, say goodbye for a couple of months or something. <laughs> Is there any other question among the audience? If it's possible, I have all your questions. And I yes, Go you. ahead. Okay, thank you are basically related with the dimensionality of the systems. For example, uh, you talked something about you made the calculations for bosonic gases. What happened when we make the one-dimensional approach because we, we can't reach a bose einstein condensation if we don't include interactions? Then, then I don't know, in, in these situations, what happens? With this type of approach, are uh, validity? Uh, are but it's possible, or I don't know. Yeah, thank you very much for this very nice question, as well. Uh, what we did, uh, uh, we considered first the ideal Bose-Einstein uh, gas, and showed that even in uh, in in finite systems, of course. Uh, in 2D, in 1D uh, systems, uh, it is possible uh, to show the existence of Bose-Einstein condensation, let me say in that way. So uh, what we showed that, uh, we didn't publish it uh, because we were dreaming to, to do this, the same thing by considering the interactions together with Alhun. But uh, 
many years ago I did some calculations and there I show that in an anisometric un domain like uh, the rectangular box we consider it if the L1, L2 and L3 are uh, different from each other uh, uh, it is possible to show that uh, there are seven different Bose-Einstein condensation temperature uh, it is possible uh, if you change the size of the domains uh, in a very uh, specific way uh, you may observe uh, seven different Bose-Einstein condensation phenomena so this is uh, the ultimate uh, situation of course but at least you may uh, see that uh, uh, instead of condensing on ground state first uh, the system condens uh, condenses on surface states and then peripheral states and then ground states so at least three uh, Bose-Einstein condensation temperature you may talk about and also you may uh, prove or show that even for two or one dimensional systems uh, it is possible to uh, to observe Bose-Einstein condensation uh, even it is even if uh, it is an ideal Bose gas so uh, I don't know whether I uh, I answer your question yes it's so interesting thank you Thank you. Um, um, uh, Halil, mm, there's uh, as well that I, I spoke with this with Alto on actually to be precise. We spoke about this on <laughs> the 4th in 2018 in one of my presentations that we were talking about the whispering galleries. Remember Alto? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, e exactly. So whispering then galleries, yes. when you consider Halil uh, when you consider Bose-Einstein condensation in two dimensions, for instance, the what the so-called the polar exit and polarity and condensation, which is in the book by Alexei Kawakin and Jeremy Pollech, so then they actually show uh, what Alto, uh, so more or less what Alto has mentioned now that uh, there are several types of condensation and these whispering galleries depending on the geometries and then you get all of these different temperatures so then uh, so this is uh, as well this is realized already in quantum optics so then in that yes. sense it's a little comment that i wanted to make yeah mm, so mm, is there I, any... I just want to ask yeah in i i would like to ask uh, or better just to, to, to emphasize a little bit so in one dimension, if you are considering um, a condensation in one dimension, I would like to know which is actually the process that drives the system to the condensation when, while the system is still non-interacting. Mm -hmm. I, I, I miss your uh, question. Uh, so uh, the, the, the idea is, uh, we know that, so I, I guess uh, we are, talking here about different things. One thing is when you are in a non-interacting system and uh, you are considering a ground state Bose-Einstein condensation. Because mm -hmm. in that case, in one dimension, we are not allowed to have it. But what I, I may, I what, what I think that you are discussing here is another kind of Bose-Einstein condensation which is actually known in the ground state for the non-interacting system. Instead of that, you are get. I guess you are discussing in a higher energies, or so to say, than the ground states. So uh, it's not actually the ground state that both anything condensation for one dimension for non-interacting systems. Uh, in in one D case, uh, if the system is finite, one D but finite uh, size. Uh, then it is possible to, at least mathematically, to show that uh, there is a possibility uh, for Bose-Einstein condensation. But if you consider a really, I mean, a hypothetically, sorry, a infinitely long 1D system, then, uh, then you are right, uh, it is forbidden. Uh, if the system is infinitely long, uh, but 1D, 
then it is forbidden. And it is the same for 2D case. It is forbidden for non-interacting particles. But if 2D system is a finite 2D system, then it is possible to show that uh, there is a possibility for Bose-Einstein condensation because of quantum size effects. True, exactly. The confinement allows us to have a Bose-Einstein condensation yes. in two dimensions, even if we are discussing in a non-interacting about a non-interacting yes. system. Yes, but in yes. What, what I mean is in one dimension, even though your system can be confined, you are not allowed to have one that you are not allowed to have condensation in the ground in energetically speaking. So you are allowed to have condensation in the natural orbitals which are the eigenvalues of the density matrix, which is, which is actually not the same uh, it's actually not the same process, actually. So we are able to have condensation, yes. But what I want to emphasize is that it's not energetically speaking. So it's not that we are just really, although it is the ground state and it is the lowest exact, lowest state ah. available, it is not uh, driven by this very same kind of condensation or ground state condensation uh, in two and three dimensions. Yeah, you are right. Okay, now I got your... Uh, and, and I guess that was the question of Halil. So I just wanted to, to make the, the uh, differences because yes. it actually matters in the, in, the, in, in the moment when you really want to make a, a calculation. So it matters when you are doing your, where, where you are doing the calculation in energy domain or you are doing your calculation in the one... In the, density matrix uh, domain, so to say. Yes, yeah, you are definitely right. Yes, this is true. Uh, yeah, thank you for uh, for this explanation because uh, then I will uh, get uh, the true answer, let, let's say. <laughs> thank you. No, 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 just uh, to clarify. Okay, so I guess if there's no more questions, I'll talk. So uh, thank you very much for your nice presentation, as always, oh. and for being always a gentleman. You're one of the uh, most decent and respectful human beings that I have ever no, met. No, no, so, no, no. And, Don't say so. <laughs> and, David. You know that I enjoy that much more than science. So then, thank you, thank you so, so much, really, really. Uh, I, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, I would like to thank you all. It was a great pleasure to meet you all and to talk with you all. Uh, and really, uh, thank you so much for your kind uh, invitation and kind attention. And also, I would like to thank the Alhun for his great job <laughs> during his. PhD. <laughs> uh, so thank you all, together. actually. <laughs> and uh, thank you, Alvin. And uh, I also uh, feel myself uh, lucky to meet you, David, here three years ago. <laughs> thank you, Alvin. Uh, thank you. Um, I have I have one small question that when I was checking the slides you sent me, it just came yeah. to my mind is. Was Alhun's brother a student of yours as well? No, which one? No, Does it Alhun, I don't. Alhun, no, I don't Alhun, Alhun has no brother, but sister. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, you know Alhun's sister, but not, not a brother. And Alhun's no. dad as well. So yeah. then, <laughs> but uh, from Facebook. Uh, but yeah. there's another guy hiding in, in, the, in the group, isn't it? Uh, uh, there's there's two idins, so I thought it was Almond brother or something. Let me let me check. But, but I, now not, you confuse me. Where, uh, not in where, this where you saw that, David? Sorry? Where you saw that? In a presentation that Al took sent me uh, some time ago, and that I actually shared with my students so they could actually prepare some questions. 
So then, you, you, to Hali, to uh, Hali, uh, 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 he's, he's, he's another guy from my other research group, uh, the, the oh, group yeah. on uh, new so energy yeah, technologies. <laughs> new energy, I have another research group called New Energy Technologies Research Group. There, uh, I have a, a member uh, who has named Murat Aydın. So oh, okay. uh, the same surname, but uh, of course, uh, Alhun and Murat, they are totally different people who are interested in totally different <laughs> topics and so on. <laughs> Aydın is a common surname. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, it's, yeah, it's like Haramidu in Colombia. There's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. then, um, so, um, I, I, I as well hope, Alto, uh, that with Professor Karim, that is a very uh, enthusiastic professor. So then, we, someday we could make the school on quantum thermodynamics in here, in in maybe in a, in a nice place. Think about it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I think yeah. the Israeli guys would like to come. Uh, yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> so thank you very much for the nice talk. Thank you, yeah. Alhun, for being here. Thank you for thank Professor you. Karen, you. for hosting okay. the seminar, and thank Bye. you. In everybody, so Angel, Pedro, Professor Pedro David, Professor Diego, Diego Luis, Felipe, Gabriela, Alil, Joan, Juan Diego, Laura Viviana, Professor Lorena, Mario Germán, Roberto, and Jesid. Thank you very much. So have a nice rest of the afternoon. So thank you Bye. so much and have a nice weekend uh, to you all too. of you and nice to meet you. It's the same. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Thank you. Glad to meet you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. 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 Thanks. Gracias, profe. Estás bien. No, a ti. Estuvo súper bien. Estuvo súper linda la charla. Me gustó muchísimo. Gracias, profe. Esperemos que tengamos mucho.